It occurred to me a few weeks back uh, how often in the teachings of Christ here in Matthew we're finding that he speaks about the heart. And I could spend, as we know, months and months probably on just each one of these subjects, but I talked a few days back, a few Sundays back, on the heartbeat of, of thanksgiving, or giving thanks, and the heartbeat of, of worship and praise. This is the heartbeat of bearing good fruit, and it's a, it's a huge deal, scripturally speaking. To, to bear good fruit, but it has everything to do with the heart for those of us that are in Christ. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 15, 8, These people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips. Their heart is far from me. Who's he talking about? He's talking about his own people. He's talking about the Jews. He's, in this case today, if we'd put it in context, he'd be talking about people in the church rather than people that are out here in the world. He said, they draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. This is a very common thing even in the world we're living in. But their heart is far from me. And again, he knows. Some would say, well, that's not true. But he, he knows. He knows the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Today we're talking about what is one of those areas that springs from the heart is, is the kind of fruit we bear. Every heart does produce fruit. Every person does. Some good fruit, some bad fruit. And God expects His children to produce good fruit. And I could have given you thousands at least of, of verses out of the Bible. I'm going to give you a few today that back this up. Let's start with Jesus Himself. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. He had said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. That's what we're talking about today. The fruit of the heart. What's coming forth from this individual. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. He's talking about every good heart. That's what he means by that. But a bad tree, it bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Isn't that interesting? nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And every tree that does not bear good fruit, it is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them." Now we're going to see this theme as I read more verses, that God's very serious about the fruit we bear in this life. He's very serious about what we do with what He has given. Luke 8.15 uh, this is the parable about sowing the seed. We shared this from Matthew a while back. He says in verse 15, that the ones that fell on the good ground, he's talking about the seed of the Word of God that fell on good ground, are those who having heard the Word with a noble and a good heart, they keep it. And they bear fruit with patience. They hear the Word, they do it. Kelly spent just a little bit of time here a while ago talking about the very exacting nature of God, and that hasn't changed. He was talking about the Old Testament. I've spent a lot more time in the Old Testament than most people have. And I began to deal with a concern about however many years ago, I don't know for sure, that the present day church in America probably is entirely ignorant to the Old Testament because they spend all their time in the New. Now the New is where the fulfillment is unveiled of Jesus and the church and so forth. But the problem is, in the Old Testament, it's where God gave us His conscience. And if we just gloss over that and move to the new, we may miss a big chunk of what matters in God's way of thinking. Now, Jesus did a lot of repetition in Matthew, Mark, and Luke about things from the Old Testament. We may not know that that's what He was doing. Most of the time, He was quoting something from the Old Testament. And he was applying it to how we live it out now in a new covenant that he was beginning to birth. He's bringing to pass. But what a lot of people that are Christian people have misunderstood is the God that was exacting in the Old Testament is the same God. Now we don't have to 
do sacrifices of animals and things like that today for our sins, Jesus settled that by dying on a cross and shedding his blood and giving his body. But people are thinking, well, that means I can just approach God any way I want to, and that's not true at all. Because it always goes back to the heart. Always goes back to the heart. It did in the Old Testament, it does in the New. Kelly was reading portions about the Nazarites. They are a ministering group within the context of the priesthood in the Old Testament. And God was very exacting about those folks. What they could wear, what they could eat, what they couldn't eat, where they could go, what they couldn't do. And he expected absolute obedience. And out of that, Kelly read the verses that a lot of churches that you would go to today would, would speak those, those verses every, every service at the end of the service. God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you uh, and show his goodness to his people in essence is what those verses say. But Kelly put it in context. If we miss the point that God was very exacting about how they were to approach him, we would miss how the blessing would come because we're going to talk about that here today. People that, that are Christian now that misunderstand that God's conscience hasn't changed. How we live it out has changed somewhat. But Christians today think they can just be absolutely casual and do basically whatever they want to do, and they're not even close to being right. Because if God was exacting in the Old Testament, He expects more now than He did then. That's the difference. Some say, well, we're not under the law anymore. That's exactly right. We're in a bigger category than ever before. And God expects, it's kind of like what we think of when we have children. You know, the, that baby that comes out of the womb. Let's be honest. We expect nothing out of that baby except to cry and to eat and to poop and pee and do the things that they do. Isn't that right? But what we're expecting over time is a development of growth. Not just physical growth, but personal growth, spiritual growth in our case, and then soulish growth. To grow up to some levels of maturity. And I don't believe that ever stops while we're on this earth. We're still progressing and growing. So you see what God expects of His church children today in the New Testament is exactly the same. If you can compare the two, the Old Testament saints were more the youth, the children, the babes. Those that are in Christ today, He expects a lot more of us. He expects us to be grown up. It's one of the reasons Paul, when he wrote the two letters to the Corinthian church, was so upset. He'd spent about two years there, given them all the good stuff, made sure that it was happening in, his, in their presence, in his presence. And he had to leave because he had to continue to birth other churches around that whole, whole area where he was going. And then he got word back, they're not doing well. They're fussing and fighting. They're sin that they're not dealing with. They're just doing all kinds of stuff. And at one point he said, you're living like mere men. And that was killing him. Because you see, we're not. We're sons and daughters of the living almighty God. But they were living like the world lives, hoping to go to heaven. And I'm, I'm really concerned that that probably is a lot of where Christianity is today. Living like the world, for the most part, and hoping to go to heaven. Now, I'm not saying a lot of people won't go to heaven, but I'm saying how far beneath how God thinks. In Luke chapter 13, verse 6, Jesus spoke another parable. He said, a certain man had a fig tree. He planted in this fig tree in his vineyard. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Now, he's talking about two things at the same time. He's talking about individual people, and he's talking about churches. He said, the keeper of the vineyard said, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. He said, let me see if I can make this better. And he's probably one of the pastors is who he's talking to. And if it bears fruit, well... But if not, after that, you can cut it down. Now, this is actually how God thinks. I'm not talking about as much here losing salvation, although how can you not put all of these things in a package? That what God has given us is the most amazing free gift that any human being can ever receive, and that's the salvation through Jesus Christ. 
and becoming an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ, eternally living with God, becoming one with Him. He gives us His name. He gives us His word. He gives us His spirit. He gave us His body and His blood. He expects something in return. People say you can't earn your salvation, and they're right about that. But once you're there, God has high expectations for His kids. From the time that Adam sinned, God has been working to repair the hearts of His people. Back in Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 5, verse 1. Now let me sing to my beloved a song of my beloved regarding His vineyard. This is God's vineyard. That would be His people. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up. He cleared out its stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst, and he made a wine press in it. And so, this is God. He expected it to bring forth good grapes. Why? Because he did everything right. He put it in the best land. He cultivated the land. He planted the right kind of seed. The soil was right. He expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. Now, this is true of much of the time in the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament through, you'll find time and time and time and time and time and time again what would happen. And it always centered around whether the leaders were good leaders or bad leaders. And when they had good leaders, there would be some uh, adjusting some repentance, some changing. When they had the bad leaders, the people just kind of followed suit. And what would happen is God would look down and He would look at His people and He'd say, I'm expecting them to bear good fruit, but they're just wild grapes, meaning they're just like the world. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? God's talking there, and He could say exactly the same thing today, by the way. Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. This is God talking about His kids. I will take away its hedge. It shall be burned. I will break down its wall. It shall be trampled down. This is kind of the opposite of what Kelly was talking about, the blessings of God. This is what God is saying will happen if we choose to go against Him. You know, if you go back in the Old Testament law, uh, Moses in chapter 28, I believe it is, gives a list of the things you will receive and the blessings of God that will come upon you and overtake you if you obey Him diligently. And then he gives a lengthy discourse of what will happen to his children if they choose to not do that. Some would say, well, that sounds like works righteousness, and it's not. Righteousness is always going to come from God. Jesus is our righteousness. He's my holiness. He's my sanctifier. He's all of that. But then what does God expect from his children? Several years ago, a man named uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German, wrote a a lot of things, but one of the things he wrote was, was about uh, cheap grace. That, that's not the title of it, but that was the essence of the book. I was required to read that when I was in Bible college, and it was a good thing that they should have required us to read it. He was talking about probably near a hundred years ago. What he was seeing in the church was people were taking very casually and lightly the sacrifice of Christ. Cheap grace. They were making confessions, I want to be saved and I want to go to heaven, but they were still living in a way that didn't bear the fruit. And Dietrich said, this is not right. This shouldn't be the case. Well, the thing is, if Dietrich was still alive today, he would say, well, it's a lot worse now than it was then. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't Christians that are absolutely belong to the Lord today and love Him and obey Him and hear His voice and do His will, because there are. But then we look at the whole package and what do we look at? We're looking at the fruit. Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit. Well, it would be true also of a culture. Let's talk about the United States culture, for instance. The morality of the United States. Let's not even deal with Mexico and Canada and Japan and Germany. Let's just talk about the United States. And I'll talk about my impression of the United States in the years that I have lived, which is now 69 years. 
what I have seen morality wise and culture wise a continual slide in the years I've, I've lived I don't believe I'm being unfair I believe you could probably all agree that it's true well why is that well you know what I think because I say it all the time I say it's the church's fault because there's only one source of light in the world and that's the church Jesus said that he said we are the source of light you're the light and lights of the world so that light means revelation it means understanding but it also goes with it carries with it some responsibility for instance those of you that work for companies corporations uh, they are allowing you to work for them uh, basically using their name at some level to represent their company their corporation Craig works for direct TV these days we got some Cox employees here in the room we've got some Assemblies of God and Evangel University employees we've got folks that have had all kinds of different jobs through the years too including me and you know the thing is it's not unfair for that company to expect their employees to bear good fruit it's not unfair it's true. they should expect that now I'm not saying that all companies are righteous and holy because we know better that's not always the case but they should expect that well God expects it for his from his children and my goodness he's giving us a lot more than our companies give to us even though they are blessing us to let us be able to work as it has been said I came to them and asked for a job that's how this is and so he said this is what I will do verse 6 I will lay it waste he's talking about this vineyard that is not producing good fruit it shall not be pruned or dug there shall come up briars and thorns I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it see he's serious about this for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel this again is the Old Testament we could be comparing it to the church today and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant he looked for justice but behold oppression for righteousness but behold a cry for help well we are in the New Testament we are the fruit bearing branches from the tree of life and that's Jesus let me just read some of the verses from John 15 one of the most beautiful places in the whole Bible these are words of Jesus starting at verse 1 I'm the true vine and my father is the vine dresser see he's taking those stories I was just reading to you and bringing them into the New Testament and saying now this is how this works there still is a, a vineyard the vineyard today is the church Jew or Gentile the church is his vineyard and Jesus said I'm the true vine and there actually is only one uh, another way to say it he's the tree of life there's only one and my father he's the vine dresser he's the one that takes care of this and every branch in me and now that's us every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit how many of you folks know that when we've got a tree or a bush or or something we're trying to grow let's say that that would bear fruit like a tree of, of apples there was Grandma Wood and Grandpa Wood had a, had a peach tree out in front of their house. You remember that, Kelly? Might have been a couple, three out there. It was when you pulled up the, the dirt road to get up to the top of the hill where their farm was, on the other side of that little drive area were some trees, and, and one or two at least were, were peach trees, and you could smell them when they were in bloom. It was a beautiful smell to me. Uh, Christy and I flew down to... Orlando one time in the very middle of the winter we were having one of the worst winters we'd ever had in Springfield at that time snow and all that stuff and we flew into Orlando and it was 70s at least I don't know what it was that day we got out the first thing I noticed when I got off the plane I smelled orange orange blossoms oranges well see God expects for us to bear fruit but father is the vine dresser so what's he going to do to those that are bearing fruit he's going to prune them well you guys you know what that means right he's going to cut off part of you parts of you he's going to cut some of that what's he doing he's fine-tuning us he's saying that flesh that you died 
with Christ with still wants to live at times, I'm going to need to keep fine-tuning you. Not only through the Word of God and the Spirit of God, but through experiences of life. And He will cut off parts of us and would say, well, I don't know that you need to cut that one off, Father. It seems like that one's okay. It's been okay until now. He said, well, maybe so, but now it's not. The Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in Christ that bears fruit, the Father, He prunes that it may bear more fruit. And then Jesus said, you're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. He's talking to His disciples. And then He says, abide in Me and I in you. Now this is where Jesus is taking the Old Testament to a new level of what the new covenant's going to be like because He's going to fix our heart problem. We were sinners. We could worship God in the Old Testament. We could obey God in the Old Testament. We were still sinners, sin nature. He's got to fix that. So he's going to fix the heart by taking our bad hearts with him to the death, to the tomb, and then when he comes out alive three days later, he brings us out a new creation. That means a new heart. Spirit, then soul is being worked on, and then eventually our new body. And he said, this is the way you're going to need to do this if you want to bear a lot of fruit. You need to live in me, and I need to live in you. And he's talking about that becomes your heartbeat. Thinking about the fact that he literally is my heart, is Jesus, and he's living inside of me, and I'm thinking about this one way or the other just all the time. Even when you're doing your job, you're still aware of that it's the Christ heart in you that's coming out. He said, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Now that makes very much sense. Along the way we've had, we've got one tree, Christy and I have several bushes, one tree. And that's, that's more than I want because it just runs havoc with the yard. The, the roots are just tearing up our yard and then you have to deal with leaves. You know, those, those uh, hellish things, <laughs> which they're not. But anyway, ev anyway, we have one tree, and we've already had to do a little trimming on it more than once. We actually did some of it ourselves when it was shorter. Now that it's gotten bigger, we had Jordan come and do some of that here about a year ago. He's a good friend of Craig's and ours now. And uh, they get up in the tree and they do things that I don't want to do and really don't know how to do. What was Jordan doing? He was pruning the tree for what reason? To make it more healthy to make it bear more fruit in essence, to do well. But every branch that's not connected, it will not bear fruit. So what I saw Jordan do that day is cut off some of the limbs. Now we've all done this, right? Well, you can take that limb and stick it there on the ground and you know what's going to happen to it, right? It's just dead almost instantly, but it will get more and more dead. Because it's not connected to the source. Jesus is our source. And so he said, if you don't abide in me, and he's talking about the lifestyle, the heartbeat. He's not saying that you didn't go forward and make a uh, confession of faith or profession of faith at one time to be saved. He's saying, you're not abiding in me. You're not living there. You're, you're not setting your mind on the things of the Lord. He said, what will happen there is that branch is kind of trying to do its own thing. And so it's not going to be able to bear the kind of fruit that it's supposed to bear because it's not connected rightly to Jesus. He said, a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. It lives there. Neither can you unless you abide in me. He's going to say it again. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Why does Jesus continually use repetition? because we humans aren't famous for hearing the first time. But you know, even if we heard it, that doesn't mean that hearing it again, God can't take us beyond. You know what? I can read some of the same verses in the Bible today that I've been reading for uh, at least 47 years, but really longer than that. And every time I read it, there can be something new about that word that comes to me. He said, if you abide in me and I in him, he said, you will bear much fruit. That's a fact. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, now this is the part that we saw in the old covenant writings as well. He will be cast out as a branch and it's withered. 
and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, now hear this, that you bear much fruit. This is the Father's desire. Jesus said, and I shared this a couple of weeks ago, it's the Father's desire. He's seeking those to worship Him. He also has a desire for His children to bear much fruit. How many of you know people, your own children or people that you've watched grow up, nieces, nephews, friends, you've watched these children, and it does your heart well, as Grandma would say, to see them do well, right? We want them to prosper. Christy and I have a couple of grandkids through Kyle and Amy. We have some others actually, but we've got those two. It does our heart well to see our grandsons do well. It does our heart well to see our children do well. It does our heart well to see people that we love and care about do well. He said, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. And then he says, so you will be my disciples. You see, there's no such thing as a disciple that's not a disciplined learner, a disciplined obeyer. That's what a disciple is. You can make a profession of faith, of salvation, and not become a disciple. Now, that's not God's will, but I think that happens a lot. But a disciple, that's someone that lays it all down and says, I belong to you. A disciplined learner. The word methetes for disciple. It's the word we get mathematics from. Disciplined learner. Jesus said, verse 16, you did not choose me. I'd like for you guys to say that uh, to yourself. I didn't choose Jesus. Say that. I didn't choose Jesus. Now that's blasphemy to a lot of Christians today. Now when he came and chose me, then I had a choice to make. There's no question about that. But he came and brought me life, and then I have a choice. Embrace it, and then live it. He said, you did not choose me. I chose you, and I appointed you. This is verse 16, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, meaning it's the good kind of fruit. It's not that kind, you know, you buy some bananas. You know, even if you play all the games they tell you to play, they still don't last very long, now do they? And my wife, has a very low tolerance for bananas that have gotten any kind of mush to them. I'm a little easier to deal with than she is there. I have my problems too. But you know, fruit, even at its best, even apples that can last longer than some things, they still go bad after a while, don't they? He said, I want you to bear much fruit, and he said, I want your fruit to remain. Well, what's he talking about? Both the fruit that you show forth from your life, but then the fruit that you bear in other people. Because really, that's where this fruit always comes around to. And then he said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Now also, not only is Jesus the tree of life that we're connected to, but we have the Holy Spirit. For good fruit grows by an intimate life in the Spirit. Galatians 5, and 23. The fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about fruit today, right? The good stuff. Fruit of the Spirit is love, and it's joy, and it's peace. It's long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, this is what we know, but let me just rehearse it again. Fruit is something that is produced in us. We are not the source. I'm not the source of good fruit. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, are the source. Only the Holy Spirit can conceive and bear the fruit of the Spirit in us. He is the source of all good fruit. The apples on the tree do not make the tree alive. Dead apples don't produce living trees, per se. Now, you can take the seeds, of course. But the apples don't give life. They are a sign that the tree is alive. Listen to this. The life produces the fruit not the other way around. So let me back up and read that list of some of the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Well, it's, it's God's version of love, right? It's not the love sometimes that we hear about in the world, but it's the love of God. Joy and peace. We're going to be talking about these, those, those three things the next three weeks. 
we're going to talk about joy and peace and love coming into the Christmas time here. You don't, you don't create that. I didn't create this love. It was given to me. I don't create joy. I use it. I don't create peace. I enjoy it. I am one that needs to have fruit being born that's long-suffering. That's, that's someone that's very forgiving, uh, patient. My goodness, I don't know about you, but my flesh is certainly not patient. In fact, no human flesh is. Well, where do I get patience? God. He comes and lives inside of me, and it grows. Fruit is supposed to grow over time. Being kind. Why did Paul put that in as part of the fruit of the Spirit, to be kind? Because it's so much easier not to be, at least in the flesh world. You know what I mean? And my goodness, how easily offended we are in this world we're living in by how people do business and things like that. Goodness, being good to people, faithful, that's for faithful to God and faithful to others. This is a fruit that needs to grow. You know, gentleness, self-control, that one is a big deal to me, self-control. I believe that what God expects of Rick Clark is that on the day that he gives me permission to leave this body and to get my new one, which is a promotion by billions times over. But when we're, I'm not done here. And when we're done, and he gives me that permission to have the new body and to go, I believe he's expecting me to have the biggest fruit of all of these categories of the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the faithfulness, the goodness, self-control. There should be more fruit happening with me than ever in my life. Now, I probably will have a lot less human energy. I've got that right now than I had a few years ago. Kyle and Amy were over yesterday, and he was kind of making fun, I think, of the fact that everyone in the room, uh, Bryson and Riley were not in the room, but everyone in the room was needing to use reading glasses to read some of the paperwork except him. <laughs> well, son, don't be boasting. Yeah. <laughs> don't be boasting, son. He also still has hair. Now he may be like Max, he may end up living his life with hair. And I say, God, how unfair is this? <laughs> but the fact is, that's okay. Because if that was my bottom line in life, then I've, I'm, I, why am I not in heaven now? I mean, I already got rid of my, most of my hair. God has been so good to me. And he expects me to use what he's given. And he wants it to grow because that's the characteristic of fruit. It grows. Intimate of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me. Very sensitive to his presence. Intimate with Jesus, who's the tree of life living in me. And then intimate with the Father. Our good fruit is also to feed and heal the nations. So it's more than just about me. Back in Ezekiel, there's a beautiful story that I'd like to read more of. We'll just read one verse. Chapter 47, verse 12. This is a vision that God gave Ezekiel, the prophet, about a day that I believe is this day. I believe it's the day in which we're living. Along the bank of the river, and that river, of course, we'll see is the river of life for the Holy Spirit. On this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food their leaves will not wither. That's us. There's one tree of life, but connected to him, we are the branches. And he said, their leaves will not wither, their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. That's from the Almighty God's throne. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Let me pick that up then in the book of Revelation, chapter 22 verses 1 and 2, because here we have Jesus giving John the fuller picture of what he gave Ezekiel back there in the Old Testament. Verse 1, God showed me, this is John talking, a pure river of water of life. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. That's, of course, Jesus, the Father and the Son. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, that's Jesus, who bore 12 fruits, each, yield, each tree yielding its fruit every month. 
and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Let me say this again, as if I don't say it enough. I am here not just for, to bless my God directly, which I do, but I'm here to have an influence on the world in which we live. Now, you have to let God lead you there. I can't just go out here with un unhinged and just try to fix everything because the anointing of God doesn't work like that. His anointing leads us, guides us, speaks to us, corrects us, puts us where we need to be. But I am connected to the tree of life. I'm a branch. There will be no other place except the branches that are connected to the tree that are going to bear the good fruit on this earth. Now, there are people that don't know Jesus that do things that we could call good things. And God wouldn't argue with that. But it's not in the category of eternal fruit. You can give to the poor. You can help someone that's uh, had their house blow away with a tornado. You can do all of these good things. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. But the good fruit we're talking about is ordained by God to come through the life of Jesus and the Holy Spirit into us and then affect the world. And what the scripture here says is the fruit that comes from you and me will not only feed the nations, but it will also be medicine for the nations. The fruit, the love of God can be healing to people that we love. You know, people want to be loved. Offer them peace. Jesus said this all the time when he was here. His guys were all the time freaking out about something and I would have been the same. And he almost always started every sentence by, being, by saying peace. He was imparting that force of presence. It's called peace. We'll talk about next week the joy of the Lord. He wants that to be full in us. And the peace and the love. You see, that's what we were given. Now He wants me to give it away. Give it away. Well, let Him lead me. Show me how to do that. Show me, Lord, how to love someone today. Show me how to be kind to someone today. Show me how to not be dealing with my own selfish desire, which is so common for us to uh, uh, kind of default back to. I am a Christian. I've been one for a long time. And even at my age, I have found that I can default back to my old fallen nature at times and may not even recognize for the moment that that's what I've done. Well, that doesn't produce good fruit. In fact, it certainly brings some harm to the good fruit that's growing. So we need to deal with that. And what we do is we repent. We say, cleanse me by the blood of Jesus. And then we say, I want to bear good fruit. I want to show like Jesus. I want to do like Jesus did when he was here. And Jesus said it. He said, you'll know them by their fruits. Craig, you want to come and help me, please? Father, there's none of, none of us, none of us that can take credit for the good that you have given us through Jesus, through your spirit. But what we can do is we can be a people that are rich in thanksgiving, a heartbeat to thank, thank you and give thanks, heartbeat to worship and praise you. But Lord, your word says you want us to bear good fruit. As Kelly was reading earlier in the Old Testament, you had expectation for your people, and you certainly do today. And it thrills your heart, Father, when your children bear good fruit. And Lord, I understand that. It makes all kinds of sense. And Lord, you don't want us to walk around feeling guilty all the time, you just want us to love you live in you, abide in you, think about you, let your word dwell richly in us. And the scripture says if we do that, we will bear much fruit. It's just a fact. As we abide in your presence, let your word continue to transform us, your spirit and your word. We bear fruit. And we find that we're bearing fruit in ways we never dreamed because you'll put us in places with people that we wouldn't have gone, but you just do that. And today, Lord God, it's my pleasure, it's my honor to be a branch in the true vine. 
And Lord God, I thank you for the good fruit that has been born, but I'm so desirous that in my days to come, you'll give me grace to continue to bear, bear much fruit. Oh, my heart will, it will sing forever. How the Savior died for me how he came to die and save me he forgave me now i'm free so i lift my Praise to heaven, I'm forgiven, I'm redeemed, yes we are, and how I love you, precious Jesus, oh yes, you have freed us. Eternal.